see the quick working group is now in the meeting, which is good. Yeah, by the end of this, we'll all have a full mental model of replacing between working groups and like AB programs and research groups and who is actually behind those. And maybe by then WebEx will fix that bug. The entire working group is on the call? How big is the working group anyway? So I found with one person where that was happening, the name of the working group actually crossed into another WebEx session, like direct chat. But then as soon as I had a direct message with that person, their current name showed up. It was really weird. How we should make California it a working group? I'm just going to make it a, I'm just going to keep asking people who show up with working group names. Are you speaking for yourself or for the working group? And make it fucking annoying enough that they'd have to go change it somehow. Although the problem Even is that it's a huge it, pain to change cached it. information. That's the thing with WebEx. It's not only a huge pain, it's kind of impossible. But just, Janet, to clarify, I always speak for MapRG. Because MapRG is anyway the most important group in this whole setup, right? So, just to be sure. <laughs> okay, then I have done the impossible. Yeah. Because I was able to replace my TAFS working group and log in with my name as guest. So mm -hmm. every time I have to get in and type my name as guest. Join the meeting as guest. That's where you get the options. So are you so using the the desktop app or the, the desktop app, yes. Oh okay. Interesting. <laughs> so I think I might have fixed it. The WebEx app was not happy about logging me in as the working group. Um but it appears to have done so now. Okay, so we just need to find the record button and then I think I think it is recording. It says it's it says recording in progress anyway. Oh, I was looking on the wrong side. Apologies for that then. Okay. So um thank you everyone for your patience. I'll look into the camera so you can see into my eyes. Um this is a work a quick working group interim meeting on the special topic of version negotiation. So um thank you to all those who have joined. Um, as mentioned, we have a note taker, Chris Wood. Um, I can't see his name in there, but I, I presume he's one of the working group or research group. Berg. Berg, yes, thanks. Uh, but if anyone would like to help him, um, that would be fantastic. Um, similarly, uh, if we got a volunteer for Java scribing, I can't imagine that's too much work. Um, would anyone like to take that mantle? Okay, I I can probably do it, um, and I'll get on uh, once once we've handled some of the the chair administrivia. Um, so let's cover the note well. Um, uh, let's just touch on the agenda first. Um, no, we'll do that after actually. Uh, just can I confirm that everyone can see this screen? Is it legible? Maybe I'll increase the text a bit. Um, yeah, I mean, so, that, that was really, really tiny. <laughs> we'll keep going. I can fit more on the screen. Um, so, you know, the the note well is a reminder of IETF policies um, that are in effect during uh, various topics uh, for this session and affects various topics such as patents or codes of conduct and is meant to point you in the right direction. Uh, exceptions may apply. The IETF's debating policy and definition of an IETF contribution and participation are set forth in BCP 79. Um, if you're not familiar with the note well, please do familiarize yourself. Um, but as, as a quick you know, overview and reminder that participating in the IETF, you agree to follow our processes and policies. Um, and there's an important things there relating to you know how you conduct yourself in the IETF and how your contributions are recorded and distributed. So it's important stuff. And uh, makes for healthy contribution into the IETF. Um, going back to the agenda, um, we, we're a bit short of time just due to the uh, recording stuff, so we'll try and keep the administrative review and the wrap up as brief as possible to give full time to the agenda. Um, unlike some of our other working group meetings, we don't have a, a fully, you know, um, blow by blow agenda here. That's going to be a bit preform. 
which is going to be a bit difficult to manage. So um, I, I would appreciate everyone's best efforts in trying to keep focus towards us finding an, an answer to, to how to keep driving progress in the version negotiation draft. Um, that, that's effectively the purpose for this meeting. Um, we, we discussed this at the quick interim, uh, the quick meeting during the last IDF meeting. Um, and uh, kind of the broad high level comment here is that we have something, but it seems maybe too complex for what what the needs are. Um, and that we're maybe not fully aligned on what the needs and the opportunities for vision negotiation are with some of the opportunities or or possibilities that are on the table. Um, there's in the meantime, there's been some mailing list discussion and a discussion on GitHub. Um, and so uh, the, the broad outline we have for this session is that we'll let um, the editors of the version negotiation draft itself kind of make some brief opening remarks um, and then open the floor to kind of anyone who's responded to the mailing list to to like, or or made a comment somewhere that maybe has a strong opinion to give a brief kind of high level overview of of some of their ideas or some of their themes, particularly if they're contrasting with what the document includes today, um, or or maybe present a solution in that space and based on those kind of high level overviews that the hope for the chairs is that um you know we, we can have maybe an open floor and open issue discussion that can um pick up on those things in particular based on what you guys and um think about this stuff so uh we put out a call for any uh, you know actual concrete presentations that anyone wanted to do uh, Watson kindly responded um, and, and asked for some agenda time. But um, like I, I want to make clear, we we have time to either go specifically over open issues if people think there's value from that, or to to discuss this. Um, you know, but that's kind of where we're at. So um, that said, would anyone like to bash the agenda as it's laid out here? And I'll again, I'll zoom in slightly, make that easier. To read. Uh, I'm not hearing anything, so um, let's not dilly dally for longer. Um, so I shall pass over to David to um, make some opening remarks. Thanks, Lucas. So I'm David Skenazi. I don't have any slides, so I shall just briefly present some remarks. Uh, I'm one of the uh, editors of the version negotiation draft, along with Eric Roscola. Uh, he had a conflict, so he can't be with us right now, but he said he'd try to be here for the second half of this meeting. Um, but to quickly over go over the history, uh, if you haven't read the draft or seen uh, my presentation at the last IETF that I'm not going to go through that entire presentation again. We don't have the time, but it might be worth doing that for you. Uh, and it does, it tries to explain what's in the draft, uh, the concepts and the mechanism. Um, but what we're here to talk about today is like really next steps. So we presented this at uh, last IETF. Um, there weren't any complaints about the whether the solution worked or not, but there was a sentiment that maybe the solution was too complicated. And I think we can all agree that there's enough complication to go around in quick. We don't need any bonus complication for fun. So if we can make things simpler, that's better. Uh, and so kind of my reply at the time was, let's hear more proposals because I would love to make this simpler, but I just couldn't come up with a way to do that. And so if there are ways to you know, keep the same feature set and uh, make the proposal simpler, no questions, let's just do that. If there are ways to reduce the feature set um, in order to make it simpler, then that becomes a trade-off and a discussion we should have. And that's kind of why we're all here today. So I think that's all I have to say. Uh, I'm gonna hand it off to uh, back to the chairs for, for to hand off to folks who have like actual proposals on how we might be able to simplify this. All right, that's it for me. Uh, 
Thank you, David. Um, okay, I see Kazuho has just joined the queue. Uh, Kazuho, please go ahead. Uh, David, thank you for the opening remarks. Uh, regarding uh, how we proceed in the budget negotiation draft, uh, my preference goes to just defining the incompatible budget negotiation flavor and do nothing on the compatible budget negotiation side. And the reason is that follows. I've said this on the mailing list, but there are two ways of extending print. One is by using budget negotiation packets, and that's the only way to extend this extend quick when something other than TLS is being used for the handshake, for example, noise. But unfortunately, Quick V1 does not provide budget negotiation in a secure way because it does not provide downward pre prevention. The other way is using transport parameters. It already provides downgrade prevention implicitly due to TLS handshake being tamper proof. So if somebody wants to implement compatible version, uh, compatible version negotiation, there's nothing that has to be done at this moment uh, in Quick V1. And we don't know how a future compatible version would look like. Then, based on that, I think what we might want to do is what we have to do, the minimal, minimal thing that we have to do. And that would be to implement a downgrade prevention in Quick V1 for incompatible versions. As I said, it's a must for Quick variants that don't use TLS, but all other things are something that we don't have to do at this moment. And I prefer punting that to the future when we actually design a new version of Quick. Thank you, Kazuho. Um, would anyone else like to take a few minutes just to outline their stake in the ground? I might. I, like Kazuho, I'm a bit puzzled by uh, the difference between the incompatible and the compatible version negotiation. Uh, I I kind of like the idea of keeping just one. Uh, I was uh, interested in keeping just a compatible version, but Kazuo makes a very strong point that uh, if we have new versions, they will most probably be incompatible. Like if we are going to change, for example, a switch from TLS to something else, that definitely will be incompatible. So, uh, I, I I see his point. I or, I entered an issue about the quirks of the compatible version negotiation, which leads to changing the version number in the long header at a random time in the handshake. And uh, I don't like that too much because uh, on one hand, uh, it's uh, a cue given to third parties that of what we are doing. And on the other hand, there's some kind of uncertainty that why am I receiving this new version packet when the negotiation is not concluded? And so I'm, I'm torn there and I kind of like uh, Kazuo's approach. Thank you, Christian. Uh, I think Martin was in the queue. So, so yeah, thanks. Uh, in in terms of the cutting one or other, um, I, I don't know if it's premature to, to decide at this point, but it's good to know where people are thinking on this one. My my initial thought was that the the incompatible stuff was was what we had to have, and the compatible stuff was was basically cream. We, we a bonus, and um, it turned out that um, I was convinced ultimately that the that the bonus wasn't so much a bonus when it came to looking at how people are going to deploy this, because the the ad added latency involved with the incompatible style of version negotiation leads to some perverse incentives um, 
which um, might mean that we have some problems with deploying of new versions. So um, uh, when you balance that against the relative simplicity of the ultimate design when you run through all of the analysis, then um, I'm, I'm kind of okay with the idea of defining both. Um, the overall design is relatively simple to implement, if not exactly simple to analyze. Thank you, Martin. Uh, David, please. Yes, so speaking less as editor and more as just a working group member who has thoughts and opinions, uh, I want to second to um, second what um, Martin just said. Um, there, like, if we want to remove some features, um, I, I have to ask the question, uh, like Kazoo was suggesting, for example, why do we want to do that? Uh, and, you know, the answer I suspect is uh, for simplicity. Um, but uh, like Martin was saying, like we we probably need a bit more deployment and uh, implementation experience here. Um, but I, my personal opinion is that if we go for simplicity as, at all cost, uh, even you know dropping many features, we risk uh, we run the risk of painting ourselves into a corner where if let's say you only have compatible or negotiation, for example, it means that it prevents anyone from deploying versions of Quick that are not compatible. And like at Google, we have those, for example. And if we only go with incompatible, it means that um, there will be there will be cases where uh, folks have to pay a round trip. And because you know the main selling point of Quick is latency, uh, not wanting to burn a round trip is going to cause people to go through all sorts of contortions and do something that is less optimal than what they could have done if they had had uh, compatible version negotiation. So my, uh, my take would be that if we want to remove some of these features uh, and the only argument is simplicity, let's quantify the simplicity and see exactly what we were saving here, both in terms of standardization work, which you know, I'll, I'll lump in the like analysis as part of that. And on the other hand, as uh, implementation work slash deployment costs, I think uh, both of those uh, axes need to be uh, analyzed. Thanks. Thank you. Kazuho, please. Thank you. So, uh, well, I'm not sure if we have to choose one of the two. I mean, as I said previously, uh, not having incompatible version upgrade, uh, version negotiation is going to prevent uh, some of us are uh, from developing a new flavor of Quick or deploying a new flavor of Quick. Compared to that, not having compatible version negotiation at this moment doesn't prevent anybody uh, from implementing their own version of own compatible version of Quick because they can use transport parameters in the way they want to advertise that the application uh, packets, the short header packets would be something other than quick rerun. Thank you, Martin, please. Yeah, so this is an excellent point. Um, and there's there's a couple of things. Ryan points out that um, the, the decision to punt compatible negotiation is one that we could make very easily. Um, my sense based on what I've seen here is that it is pretty well um, decomposable in the sense that you could take it out and do the incompatible piece without um, any disruption if you put the compatible stuff back in again. And so that's not a, not a problem. And Kazuo kind of makes an interesting point, although maybe it wasn't exactly the point that you made, um, which was that for a lot of people's use cases, uh, compatible basically means making extensions to the core protocol rather than changing the core protocol's meaning. And uh, that is enough for a lot of the sort of immediate term use cases that we have. The only consequence of that being that we don't see new version numbers on the wire. But maybe that's okay. Yana? Lucas, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump in here. I was in the queue before Martin, but it's fine. Lucas likes to ignore me anyways. Um, 
I, I want to support what Martin just said uh, in support of uh, uh, what Kazuo said as well. I was going to I'll add one thing to what Martin said, which is that I think it's slightly stronger than that. I don't know that there's anything here. Do we, we can define a, I believe that we can define a transport parameter that basically changes what version appears on the wire as well, right? We just haven't done that. Is that not the same as uh, what compatible version negotiation is? Like if I, if I define a transport parameter that says every packet after this point, once you received it and acknowledged it, is going to be treated as something else. That could certainly be the semantics associated with a transport parameter. Um, is compatible version negotiation fundamentally different than that? Martin, you're saying that doesn't work. Yeah, just to quickly respond there, it doesn't work because mm -hmm. of the way that um, the protocol works in zero RCT and a bunch of other things like that, because you don't have a clear demarcation point for saying the new behavior starts now uh, in, in quick. And so you can't, you can't do some things with uh, extensions to the protocol. You have to change the version of the protocol in order to get the, the, the new behavior. Just like you need to use ALPN to get a new application behavior. Maybe I don't understand Thanks. the compatible version negotiation fully, but it's it's how is that any different for compatible version negotiation? Uh, compatible version negotiation essentially says um, this protocol was always version two, even though you started off with version one. We're just sort of um, massaging the history um, by transforming yeah. it into version two. Uh, and a transport parameter can't say that. Uh, Good luck with that. Um, no, I, I mean, that, that, that's, I mean, ultimately the code's the same. You're talking about signaling. Uh, yeah, I guess you could. I mean, that's, that's my point. Ultimately, the way I see that is that you're, you're signaling through a transport parameter, then call it a transport parameter. You are verifying downgrade protection yeah. through the handshake completion. So that's what we do transport parameters anyways. It's not, not really, it's really not really compatible with the way that transport parameters operate. Anyway, we should let the, the folks in queue speak. Fair enough. Yep. Yeah. But thank, thanks for that. We, we've got some people in the queue. I just want to remind people this was an opportunity for some opening remarks, and then um, we'd like to go on to, to some of Watson's slides who, who maybe will dig into this. So um, I'm not cutting the queue. Um, I'd like to keep the conversation flowing. But um, yeah, we, we have some time. We can come back and forth to these things. Uh, and with that said, uh, I believe it's Kazuho next. Did I get it right? I think Kazuo said he let it minus Q later on. Ah, okay. Um, and Christian minus Q. I mean, if you have something you'd like to say right now, that that's fine. Um, I'm just being mindful. All right, I guess I'm next in the queue. Yeah. yeah. Just to, to, to address the point of extensions versus version negotiation. So to be clear, for many things, Ex extensions are the right solution. Uh, let's say you want to add a datagram frame, you want to add timestamps. Like these are things that are best suited for extensions because it allows you to interoperate with an implementation that doesn't support your extension. You can interoperate on the base protocol. So that, that, that's a good thing. Um, there, however, if you want to say like change the format of handshake packets, that's a different story. Um, like so the the idea there is you know you a packet in quick is self-defining like you can parse a packet by itself and so if you want to change the format like then you would the distinction i would draw between you know an extension that like changes some things and a new version is that like you would have this new version on the wire which means that when you get this handshake packet you'd be able to interpret it completely differently because you have this new version that gives allows you to have that signal that there is a new way to parse this and that. So I'm not saying that version negotiation should replace extensions for most things, but there are things that we need to do, we, we will most likely want to do in this protocol later that aren't handled by extensions. And this is what all this is about, because um, at the end of the day, we could also just declare failure um, 
say quick v1 is the only version of quick all other versions are blocked on the internet and i'll go home and say like uh, you know the only thing we can do is then with extensions and then you build a version negotiation mechanism inside extensions like tls did at that point i mean we've we're way ahead enough that we can prevent this and like we were saying before the best um way to prevent ossification is to ensure that we kind of exercise this uh, this joint by having a, a few versions. So if this working group comes up with you know version two and three in the next few years, that'll help prevent some level of ossification. So there might be value there. That is a whole other tangent, but I think there is a, an important distinction to be had between what can be done with extensions and what can be done really should be done by separate versions. Thank you, David. Uh, I, I'm just going to cut the queue there. I think we've got some people in line, so um, this seems okay. Uh, I believe it's Ryan next. Yeah, just to kind of follow up on what David was saying, um, if I understood Kazuho's suggestion correctly, it wasn't to stick with version one indefinitely and only make changes via extensions uh, or Maybe that was what he was proposing, but I interpreted it to mean something different. What I interpreted it to mean was that instead of inventing a new scheme for doing version negotiation, we use transport parameters as a mechanism of saying, this is the transport parameter that causes you to switch to quick V2, quick V3, quick V, whatever it is. We still have the ability to have different quick versions on the wire but the uh, mechanism for doing the negotiation is handled through transport parameters. Um, presumably uh, doing this during the handshake itself, that, 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 that sounds a little bit challenging, but, but certainly, certainly once, once we get past the handshake, I think Kazuho's point that doing compatible version negotiation via signaling and transport parameters, that seems like a very, um, plausible path forward to me. Could I just quickly jump in to say that that's not a real distinction? That is what the draft does today. The way that compatible version negotiation is defined in the current version of the draft is built over a transport parameter. So at the end of the day, it becomes a matter of semantics where you can call it whatever you want, but we are using an extension to trigger a version change, we could just call it an extension and not say that there is another version, or we could call it a version if it goes into like semantics at that point. Thanks, David. Uh, Christian, please. Yeah, I mean, uh... The, the the more I think about that, the more what I, I see on David's point is that if we want to change the formats in any significant way, and that would be, for example, for changing the format of packets to do forward or correction, or uh, changing uh, the, the way we do encryption or, or anything like that, then we just we don't just need a negotiation we need a synchronization point so that we can say, before that synchronization point, we have this format. After that synchronization point, we have that format. And we don't have that many plausible synchronization points. We have one synchronization point, which is indeed using the version number in the packets. And we have another synchronization point, which is switching to using one RTT packets. It's are pretty much the only two that we have. And so I think we have to somehow recognize that and recognize how extensions handle that. Okay. Um, this is a really good discussion. I, I, I kind of feel sorry to cut it off, but um, I, I would want to give the opportunity to Watson um, to go through these slides. If people have thoughts or ideas um, related to the slides or not, like we have the time, keep them in mind, and what we will get to you. Um, but yes, let's let's queue this up. We've got ten minutes allocated, so it's a short slide deck. It is available on the data track or GitHub if you'd like to follow along at home. But I'm going to share these slides.
now. Um, let's try and zoom in as much as I can while maintaining parity. I think that's probably as best I can do. Um, so without further further ado, Watson, would you like to step up to the stage and direct me? All right. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so Lucas remembers the sequence of events leading this presentation a bit differently than I do. I remember being asked to, oh, remember that thing you said at three in the morning? Could you uh, expand on it? I have to remember. All right. So I, I have to apologize. I haven't been able to follow the conversation that happened right before this. So that's not reflected in the slides. Um, next slide, please. So I sort of want to talk about what I think we need, which kind of informs the rest of the presentation. The first property we need is we want a no downgrade property. We don't want an attacker to interfere with the version negotiation in a way that leads to Alice and Bob agreeing on a weaker version. This is not actually possible in full generality. Um, if you have a version that is so weak that the attacker can rewrite the transcripts, then the attacker can just use that version on both sides and you have no way of defending against that. Um, you, you can do something a little bit stronger if you can avoid that degree of weakness. Um, we also like the best possible outcome. We want to make sure the negotiation goes to quote unquote, the best outcome. What exactly that means is sort of up to definition. Um, but in particular, you wouldn't want the server to pick a worse choice. Just, and it's a little, it's like no downgrade. Um. There's complexities. Not all versions are going to have compatible initial packets. Not all initial packets work with all the versions the client is willing to speak. And there's a latency cost to getting that first flight wrong. Also, the size of the first flight matters. You can't just cram everything you want into it. So there are some tricky choices for clients to make when they're considering which version should I try to speak first to a server. All right. So let's go to the next slide. All right, so this is, I think, the central question that leads to my design looking very different than David's. Can we require that you, a server can always extract a list of supported versions from any initial packet? And if we can require that, then the server can just pick the one it wants to speak. If we don't require that, if we can just look at, um, if we can just look at the initial packet version number and see that we don't speak it and suggest a list for the client to pick from, then that's a lot more complicated because now there's potentially multiple trips and it's a mess. Um, so let's assume for the rest of the presentation that they were in the first case, no matter how nasty the initial packet's going to be, no matter how different it's going to be, it's always going to be the case that the server can pull out a list of version numbers. All right, next slide, please. So how TLS has this property, there's a supported, there's a version number, there is now a version number extension and before the client could only offer a range of versions indicated by its, by its version number. Um, the clients, the, we have the list of versions, the server picks and sends in the response what version it's going to use. And this is then part of the hand script, hand, uh, handshake transcript in a way that never collides. Um, and that's enough because then if the attacker was to modify the versions or the selection, things would break. Um, and that's, well, let's scroll down. So next slide, please. All right. So here are some of the problems and then they're all grouped under compatibility. So the first kind of compatibility problem isn't much of a problem. It's the client might speak two versions and they have sent the first flight that's only compatible with a more commonly supported version. The harder one is client thinks it can speak both these versions, it actually can't for some reason, and its first flight is only compatible with one of the versions it, it, it advertised and not the other. Then the hardest 
because it in some sense means the client can end up speaking something it never intended is the client says, oh, I support X and Y, and I've just sent you a perfectly fine opening flight for X. And the server goes and looks at it and says, actually, you sent me a perfectly fine flight for Y. Let's go ahead and use it. Um, so next slide, please. Tentative solution. So easy case doesn't really matter. You either go ahead speaking X or you tell the client, actually, I want you to try again with version Y. And when you try again with version Y, everything, you know, it's the same same set of version numbers being advertised. There's no difference uh, between our treating the compatible and incompatible ones. It just goes along. Or the server says, okay, you know what? I'm happy with version X. I don't want to take the latency hit. I'm just going to go ahead and we'll speak X. In the harder case, doesn't matter that the client thinks it's sending a, a initial flight that's compatible with more than the server thinks. The server's just going to pick X. Or it's going to pick Y, and when it picks Y, it's going to... Okay, maybe it's not so easy. Um, but, yeah, it, um, hardest case, version Y, so don't do it. Don't be in a situation where you can accidentally end up sending an initial flight that's more compatible, um, which means that the version Y has to define the, ver the flights that are compatible within an easy, consistent way across the implementations. Because if you don't have that, you'll have the problem that the two sides will start talking and they're going to disagree about, what, about the meaning of what they sent in the first round. And that's just not going to work. There'll be all kinds of problems. Next slide. All right. Um, for those of you who play bridge, you'll recognize why I called sort of recognize these things. So one of the problems we always have in the version negotiation is this latency introduced when this server doesn't like compatib com versions compatible with the first flight. Because no matter how you slice it, the server's got to say to the client, hey, come back with another first flight. And so there's a round trip induced. And there's a trade off. And if the server would like to speak a different version, uh, but they got something they're okay speaking with that's compatible, they'll probably pick the one they're okay speaking with rather than go through that round trip. Um, so there's two sorts of solutions. The first one I, I, I called site. Advertise desired versions in HTTP service or something else and remember them for server. Um, this is, so, Basically, you get tipped off what you're going to what you want to speak. Uh, magically, outside the bounds of the protocol, you you you've been given extra information, be, be it, whether it be a DNS or alt service header. The other one is after we've negotiated this quick handshake, there's no reason that we can't start negotiating the next one. So we can say, okay, well, we have this connection, but actually I would have liked it better if you had come in with version Y in the beginning. Could you please set up a version Y connection and all your other requests can go over that? Um, this is a bit messy. If there's state between them, there shouldn't be much state between them. That, that gets affected, but then you can start moving over newer requests onto this new channel you have set up. So this addresses the question of, okay, well, everybody in the world speaking version one, client and server would like to speak version two, but they don't want to spend the latency penalty of having to go back to one if they start, if they start off with two or it's too big to start off with, with something compatible with both. Next slide, please. Um, so the other thing, Big thing is we should try very, very hard to make the problem simpler. Um, and if you're doing a lot of things with extensions, so I think there's sort of a conversation that we can do everything except redesign the initial packet, that, that, that's a little bit easier to do because then you don't have to go through the version negotiation. It's not the work as hard. Also, if there's a few versions and they have a common ordering, so everybody agrees that one is that the two is better than one, or there's an experimental version that we sort of want to try, but we're happy speaking the other one, um, because then you don't, you know, the mechanism should generalize a bit beyond that. But I think this covers most of the cases 
where you really want to have the aversion negotiation system work. Uh, next slide is, I think, the last one. It's any questions? Yep, thanks, thanks, Watson. Um, good timing there. Um, we're just about time for the the slides, but let's just take the questions, and I think that can lead into the natural uh, ebb and flow of discussion. So, um, uh, we did have Mike in the queue just before I cut it, um, but David's in there now. He's given a thumbs up. Let's go with Mike, and then we'll go to David. Um, so, actually, what I was going to suggest before lines up pretty well with the presentation that if we're looking for potential complexity to remove and simplify this maybe the simplification is we don't try to change the version of the existing connection if we learn about what the peer supports the client can decide to move to a new connection with the with a mutually supported version they can decide the current one's fine let the client drive that, but use the transport parameters or potentially other mechanisms like H, uh, like service B to just find out what the server supports and make decisions from there. And potentially all you need is incompatible then and the things that give you uh, and downgrade prevention and assurance of what both sides support also gives you the information to use on your next connection. Thanks, Mike. Uh, David? Thanks. Uh, thanks for the presentation, Watson. So, on, I have to admit, sorry, I, I got kind of confused. And so, I, I have a really hard time understanding what, what you're actually proposing. Um, it doesn't help that I haven't played bridge in over a decade. Um, All right. But so when you say the HTTPS record, uh, I just want to like clarify here. This isn't for HTTP three. Uh, if you have alt service or HTTPS record or any other out of band mechanism to tell you to use Quick, which also tells you some optional information such as which Quick versions are in use, like alt service and HTTPS. You do not need any kind of version negotiation because the out of band mechanism already tells you, tells the client all of the versions supported by the server. So the client is going to use the correct version from the get go. Um, the, the problem we're trying to solve for here is for other protocols that um, you just, you know, all you have is a host name and a port and you want to do quick to them and you don't know which version of quick they're speaking. So unfortunately, we can't use, I mean, if we have HTTPS, then we can all back up and go home, the problem is already solved. Um, but then kind of going into more detail and like, I'm sorry if I'm the only one misunderstanding here, but your proposal doesn't sound any different from what's in the draft to me. And I think that's just because I'm not understanding what your proposal is. Like if there, if you had a packet diagram or something, you know, like what do you put in the transfer parameters that would help me immensely. Yeah, so I think the big, I think the big difference between the draft and my, my proposal, which admittedly is not fully fleshed out here, is the client is always listing all its versions and they are not treated differently. So in the draft, as I understand it, the client's only listing the versions it could speak from that first flight. And because it does that, when the, the server then has to advertise its own versions in response. And so the negotiation looks different for compatible versus incompatible. I'm suggesting, okay, make them the same. And what determines whether or not you're going back for another flight is, this, is whether or not you got enough state in that initial flight to continue the desired handshake. And because of that, the whole part where you re-encode what the server sent to say, this is where we are in this little dance of version negotiation doesn't have to happen. It's just the client sending exactly the same versioning information. The price of that is that the server has to know how to get that version information out of the initial packet for any version. I'm sorry, I still don't get it, uh, but that's that's maybe me. Like, uh, I think it would really help to get something a bit more fleshed out, um, but thank you. 
Thanks, David. Um, I think it's Echo next in the queue. So please go ahead. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hi, Watson. Um, so, it seems, so it seems to me that there are, um, uh, um, you know, it's probably going back to requirements here, which is um, the, um, uh, like your, so, so I mean, first of all, like we have this concept of like compatible and compatible, and I think that you just said the same thing, which is like that the initial and the version numbers have to be, um, have to be understandable, right? Um, so um, as I understand your design, um, uh, if the um, if the client is wrong about what versions the server supports, and, and the versions are like radically different, like I don't know, one is like you know one's a, one's a one's complement of the other or something, and, um, you know, um, then 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 your then your then your thing just chokes, right? Meaning they can't meaning communicate. That, okay, so the. The only the case that would happen is if the client is advertising. So the I, I don't think that's the case. The client okay. will that, advertise will, would advertise versions one, version two, and its first flight would only be compatible with version one, say, and the server would recognize that 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 if it wants to speak version two, it needs to ask for another for a version two initial flight. Okay, so I think the um. Okay, so so okay, so I think so. If I understand what you're proposing, then is you're proposing to um, to do without compatible what we call a compatible negotiation, which is to say that if the server's client's flight is valid, um, then the server accepts that version and says, "By the way, I prefer you reconnected with version a different version." But there's but there's no way that the connection doesn't upgrade itself like TLS, and um, and that. They, and, and then, they, and then, you, and then, and then, in the case where it's incompatible, you have a somewhat different mechanism for handling the downgrade attacks, which I have to think through. Is, is, am I characterizing your situation correctly? So I, I think the question is, what does compatible mean here? So in TLS, as of 1.3, the the client is listing the supported versions, and there's extensions, and those extensions, a a, a 1.2 only server. Will look at the at the advertised. Will look at the the version it's getting in the client hello and say, okay, I only speak 1.2. It will then look at the extensions and extract the information for the 1.2 handshake and continue on its merry way. And the client will follow if it supports 1.2 as well. And if it's a 1.3 server, it'll look for different extensions or maybe some of the extensions are shared, and come up with the information needed to continue the 1.3 handshake. And continue on its merry way, and they, but they both are using the same extension for the versions that are advertised. I concur. And so I guess my question is, in your design, as I understand it, if I send, um, there's no way for me to send a, a initial to be valid for V1 and V2. Instead, I send an initial for V1, and the server says, great V1, but I wish you'd offer me V2, and I reconnect. Is that correct? So I I, I tended it to work like TLS. Um, okay. But you know, yeah, I, I think the big question is: Is TLS an example of compatible negotiation or incompatible? I, in or our terminology, here? right? In our terminology, is compatible, um, which is to say that the you can send a client hello, which is valid for two versions, and the server can pick either one. And incompatible means the server says, I have no idea you're talking about. I would speak these versions. Come back with something something else I would, I would accept." Um, um, so, I mean, uh, I, I see Martin Dukes in the queue, but I guess I would just like, um, but uh, um, I there's some interesting ideas here. Um, so, so I don't, I don't want to detour too much, but that like most of the complexity in the David's and my draft is in handling the incompatible version negotiation. The compatible is actually fairly straightforward. Um, um, though perhaps it creates a bunch of a bunch of new requirements you had to had to process. But most of the complexity is about like convincing yourself that the incompatible negotiation didn't have attacks on the on the, on the negotiation mechanism. Oh, and I'm done. Thank you. Thanks, Eka. Uh, let's just get at the queue. We've got Martin Thompson. Please step yeah, up. Yeah, we do. Um, so the, it, it took me a while to get my head around this one. But um, when when Watson, uh, you said the cost of this is that the server needs to be able to pull the information out of the, the initial I want to just unpack that a little bit because
because I'm not sure that I'm following. Does this mean that we need to change the protocol such that a, an incompatible version, so a server that speaks an incompatible version can read that incompatible version, at least to the extent that it understands what versions are the client supports? I don't, so I don't think you have to change the protocol. I think you have to change the implementation expectation. If you're implementing version, you'll need to implement a, enough of version one to get to the, for the information about advertised versions. Okay, so so if, if uh, let's take a concrete example. So we're, we're shipping something with TLS right now, and there's been discussion on the list about something with noise. Does this mean that some that the TLS implementations have to implement the noise protocol to the extent that the um, that they're able to extract this information from that protocol, or or vice versa? That's that's the question. Well, so I, I I realize now that this probably means we have to go change we have to go add add invariant add just enough invariant that you can get to the version information the same way across versions. Um, just like in TLS where where we we have extension format we can never change the extension format now because right. we have to at least keep the signal that we're changing the extension format in the same place and the versions ahead of that. Yeah, I have some ideas on how you might do that, but they're actually horrific. So um, they involve stuffing everything in TLS extensions. No, <laughs> no, you know, you, you know how we do packet coalescing. <laughs> oh no! The client oh, no, sends a version don't. negotiation packet. Or, or it's like, or it's like encoded in unary and padding frames. Sure, fine, <laughs> whatever you like. I, I thought the version negotiation thing was horrific enough. Martin. Yeah, thanks, Watson, uh, for the presentation. So, I mean, I, I think, yeah, I mean, to, to reiterate what MP said, I think we're a little down the road where we've kind of assumed that VN packets would be at least part of the foundation of version negotiation. Now, now it crystallize that in the standard. Um, and I am not prepared to make the assumption that um, that like initials will remain decipherable for all time uh, beyond the invariants, which are just the, the, the single long header bit and the version field and the CIDs. Because um, the, the, we may eventually need to, if, if we do if we do see ostentation around the version, we may need to, we may need to have some sort of transport parameter based uh, um, negotiation mechanism. And so like, I think compatible VN is important uh, for that reason, but ultimately I'm not, Really prepared to abandon the version field as a technique to do this. Um, secondly, like I, I'm not, I, I think there are ways to do compatible VN that don't have this problem. But from what I understand in your presentation, I'm a little concerned that a plain old V1 server is just going to send VN packets when it gets weird version numbers and um, won't know about this transport parameter. And I'm not really sure how that will play out. So you could make this work with only the version number, but the prices you're only ever going to be advertising a contiguous range of versions. And right, so so so, so this I, is how TLS right. used to work. Yeah, so like I mean, TLS has a lot more invariance to it, uh, at least implicitly. They don't have an invariance draft, as far as I know. But um, you know, there's a lot of stuff that's going to be baked into any conceivable version of TLS, as I understand it. Um, so I mean I've been res I've been resisting the urge, but I'm just gonna I'm just gonna like drop it. I'm just gonna mention it anyway because like I, I have that version A L C draft which has not been um, adopted by anyone, but I did present it a couple of ITFs ago, and the basic idea there is to make initials secure, um, like actual actually confidential, and so like to have a mutually compatible, mutually readable by everyone initial is like is completely, um, you know. Uh, Hostile to that to that intent. So I, these are the kinds of things I would like to eventually bring into the protocol. And so I think it's really important not to have not to force the initial to be forever readable and processable beyond the beyond like the clear text parts of the header. Thanks. I think uh, Christian's next. Christian, please. 
Yes, uh, let's say that I have a lot of, of agreement with Martin, the Duke there. Uh, we have to assume that one case of new version will be a version in which the initial packet is somehow encrypted, so third parties cannot read it. I mean, there are all kinds of reasons to develop something like that. So let's call that V3. Now, if a client wants to use an encrypted initial packet so as to not disclose things like SNI or ALPN or transport parameters or anything like that, then it is not going to start with trying the least common denominator. I mean, it, it cannot do that because that will be defeat, that will be accepting defeat from the get-go. So we have to have a version negotiation mechanism in which a client tries this most secure V3 protocol. The server cannot do that because the server has not been upgraded yet. And they end up on V2 somehow. Pretty much that's the incompatible negotiation. So I think that that's a strong point. I mean, the, the focus on having an incompatible encrypted initial exchange drives you to supporting incompatible ne version negotiation. And we should pretty much recognize that. Thank you, Christian. I'm losing track of the queue. I think David next. Yes. Yes. So thanks for this discussion. I think I understand your proposal a lot better now, Watson. So yeah, I think some folks have isolated some of the problems with it already. Um, but I want to kind of address the, the, the crux of the issue and the main motivation for you to write it. Um, in what way is this proposal simpler than the one that we have in the draft today? You don't have to go back and re. So in the draft today, there, or sorry, so I, I'm not. I haven't looked at it closely at the draft today, as I remember the presentation. I have looked at a draft, but I don't really. I'm not that familiar with it yet. Um, there's a bunch where there's re-encoding of how many times have we tried to do version negotiation before? Was the server advertised those previous times, etc. And with my proposal, it's all, the client's always saying the same thing, what it supports. And so one benefit is you only ever go back once. It's only ever. Um, and so I, I think you're misunderstanding what's in the draft then. Um, the, there's never a notion of going back multiple times. The only thing that um, is like slightly simpler in yours is the way we authenticate the version negotiation packet, except because that is in the invariance, uh, your proposal is like not possible because we can't violate the invariance. And so what we have in the draft is like when you get a version negotiation packet and you want to do incompatible, you say, by the way, I received this version negotiation packet. And unless I'm mistaken, because you can't modify the VN packet itself because of the invariance, the only possible way you can make sure that that packet wasn't tampered with is by putting something of it into a packet you send later, the simplest one being you copy all the list of versions and you put that. So I, I think we're reaching a point where like, there's no way around the complexity, no matter what we do. I think that's the, like what I'm getting out of, uh, out of your proposal. Is that right? I'd have to think about it, but yeah, yeah. If we really can't add the little bit of structure, if we either aren't happy with only ever advertising a contiguous range of versions from V1 to what's in the version number, because that would work. That it would that would work with the um, and you're just sending that, you're just encoding that in V2. Um, then yeah, you can't actually send all the versions you support in the first flight all the time, and so we have to have that more complicated thing where we're saying, oh, I received this VN, et cetera, et cetera. 
Yeah, and I think, you know, based on the way Quick was designed, where versions are 32-bit and not contiguous, um, I think, you know, this is just the world we live in. Um, cool, thank you. Uh, thank you. I believe it's Eka next. Uh, yeah, hi, folks. Um, um, so I, I think it sounds like we sort of like deviated a little bit from the um, uh, 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 what's this presentation, um, which um, so I'm just going to continue with that vein unless the chair is unless Lucas tells me to stop. Um, so um, thanks, Lucas. Um, so I think like it would be. I thought we sort of had consensus on like what we're trying to accomplish, um, but I'm I'm hearing a lot of discussion now about like what we are trying to accomplish, um, and um, uh, and, and to the extent to which that is true, um, and there's just about that, perhaps we should resolve those questions about what we're trying to accomplish. Um, um, in particular, I've heard people suggest we don't need compatible. I've heard people suggest we don't need incompatible. Um, uh, I'm starting to wonder if we need either. Um, so. Um, uh, um, so I think that would be that would be useful to, to, to get clarity on. Um, I also just as a note, um, you know, while the invariants um, are invariants, they are not invariant because they're not in RSA. And so if we discover the invariants are wrong, we actually still could change them. <laughs> so, um, uh, th th but I think again, I, I'd encourage the church to like help us to get to the consensus of like what we actually needed. Um, um, I am not really, um, frankly, I'm not persuaded by the argument um, from. Um, these sort of protected initial um, messages that we need uh, version negotiation. The purpose of version negotiation is to recover from a um, misunderstood um, initial message. Um, and um, th that seems to be to have the obvious, these initial messages are, are largely intended to be, um, are largely intended to conceal the content initial message and falling back to the um, unprotected initial uh, has, the, has the impact of revealing what's in the initial message. It seems to be that having a way to say, actually, I wish you had sent me that protected thing kind of defeats much of the point. Um, and um, rather, rather there should be a recovery mechanism that's protected like in TL, like an ECH or to, or to hard fail. So I'm not persuaded that that produces an argument for version negotiation. Yeah, thanks, Eka. Um, uh, some of the stuff you said there, I think, is, is kind of echoing some of the commentary I can see in the chat about trying to understand our requirements. You know, to be clear now, um, you know, what Watson's um, proposal is, is, you know, a sample point in this whole discussion. And so I, I think you know, it's fine to for us just to carry on here. Um, I think I think it is hard that, that is, you know, for someone not deeply involved in the VN stuff to date, such as myself, um, like understanding these trade-offs is difficult. Like I don't have a strong opinion in whether it's incompatible supported or, or or not or both or none I, I think i don't know I, I don't know how how we we get to that obviously there's some people here who are, who are interested otherwise they wouldn't have shown up but um yeah take a vote that's not what we do um how <laughs> how do people want to progress like we obviously we need to do something here um yeah, I see Martin Thompson in the queue. You seem to be struggling with the Lucas. I, I guess the the problem here is that we've we just had an impassioned argument for one, and then we had an impassioned argument for essentially the diametric opposite of the same. And I don't think we have any basis for deciding um, whether one option or the other option is necessary, or as the draft would have it, why not both? Um, with the obvious consequences for that, so uh, I think we should we should probably um, get a get a real sense from people about what their their, their priors are on on the the two main features here. Do we want? No. Um, <laughs> Echo says violently apathetic. That sounds about right. Um, I, do people want to have versions of Quick that are so mutually uh, indecipherable that they, they can't be recognizable from the other one. So do, do you want to have incompatible versions is, is a question that I would ask. Um, and maybe we can start with the simple question. Uh, thanks. I, I see David was quick to join the queue as well after that. So um, yeah, please go ahead. So just in terms of 
proposing new ways to go forward and feel free to tell me you disagree. Um, we, have a, uh, we have a working group draft here that um, addresses two problems, like we said, compatible and incompatible. And we have seen that there are folks who really need one. And then we have folks who say that they really need the other. I'm in general very much um, in favor of not having something that, you know, why not both? But in this case, we have a good reason to do that in that they enable very, very different things. Um, and to be fair, uh, it's true that we could split those into two separate extensions as opposed to having them once. Um, honestly, given that they would probably need to have the same information, it seems natural to put them together, but that we can have it either way. That's not a problem. But I think, you know, why, like, in my opinion, this effort has stalled at the last ITF because multiple people came up to say that this was too complicated. And we have yet to see a single, like, fully fledged functional proposal that is simpler. And so I would say at this point, you know, I would let's move this forward. There are people who are interested, there are people who need this. If you're not interested, you don't need to implement this. This is an extension. Um, so I would just propose we move forward with this unless someone has a, another, like an actual proto, like fully fledged proposal where we actually see the war format and see how it handles multiple of these cases. But until then, I'm like no longer really interested in like humoring the, this is too complicated if, uh, but we still need everything it does and we don't know how to make it simpler. That's not getting us anywhere, unfortunately. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, David. I, I do, you know, just as a, a chair's perspective here, I, I do agree with some of those points that it, it seems in a slightly cyclical argument of, you know, what do we want? When do we want it now? What is it? No, that's too much. Uh, so it's not great. Anyway, that's just my opinion. It's a bit late here and I'm a bit tired. Um, let's go to Kazuro, please. Thanks. So, as I said earlier, I think we need incompatible version upgrade uh, due to uh, well, our commitment uh, to provide support for quick variants that do not use uh, TLS. I mean, because quick variant doesn't have a version downgrade prevention, and without that, uh, I think that's why I'm incompatible with. Big version one cannot be deployed. On the other hand, regarding uh, compatible version negotiation, as I said, I'm convinced that you know we have to design now, and I'm also sh not sure if we have enough in information to design that. Because let's say that we design V2, we, it could be the case that we want to send V2 specific parameters alongside the version indication. Then that means that it would be preferable to define a transport parameter specific. Uh, to V2 that advertises support for V2 as well as carrying those parameters. So they are, you know, design area, design space like that. And I'm not sure if we have to confine ourselves to defining a transport parameter now that only carries the versions and not the version specific parameters. Thank Thanks, Kazuho. Uh, Ryan, please. Yeah, Ecker asked a provoking question about whether we needed uh, incompatible version negotiations, specifically whether we would ever want to have two versions of Quick that were sort of mutually incomprehensible. Um, and I just wanted to observe that during the development of Quick, um, there were certainly multiple times over the the years that the protocol existed where we made utterly incompatible changes to the protocol. Um, it's certainly conceivable that maybe at some point in the future, we, we won't need to make changes like that anymore. Um, but, but certainly we sort of already have an existence proof, I think for that functionality. So I would be, I would be loath to, to rule that out. Thank you. Um, Jana, please. Thanks, Lucas. Um, 
So I want to respond to that same question that Ryan just responded to. And I want to say that I'm violently in, uh, I, in favor of doing incompatible version negotiation. To me, that is the whole point. Compatible is, is a convenience. That's the way I see it. It's basically, we could use transport parameters, but wouldn't it be nice if? That's really how I see it. And, and uh, um, it's, 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 it's convenient to be able to do it, uh, given that we already have the mechanism of transport parameters to use that to do compatible version negotiation. But really the semantics of this, the way I've, I've read it so far, are basically definable through any transport parameter. We don't have to call it version negotiation, but we can. So that's what to me makes it seem like it's a convenience, not a requirement. The whole point of version negotiation to me is when you can't actually get to that point of talking to each other and we say, okay, we have to agree first on how we talk to each other. And that's incompatible version negotiation. Because they're incompatible, you need version negotiation. If you're already talking, you can figure out a million ways of talking about what you want to talk about next. That's perfectly reasonable and fine, but it's not the hard problem or it's not the interesting uh, problem to me. Thank you. Uh, Becca, please. Yeah. So like, I'm not going to lie down the road over this, but um, like this all seems like frankly pretty like unmotivating. Um, so the um, like we have lots of examples, protocols which are incompatible with each other, SSH and TLS are compatible with each other, but we don't have, we don't have like a mechanism where you connect an SSH server and it says, I wish you spoke TLS because no one has that problem because you know exactly what the server speaks. And so the question at hand is not, do we need to have two incompatible versions of quick that can't touch each other? The question is, do we have a situation in which the client is so ignorant of the service capabilities that it has to send a, has, it has to send a message like that might be unacceptable to the server and the server might reject it and say, try, try, try another way. And, um, that is a, that's a bit, that's a much, a much, much, a, much more unusual case. And it's not a case we generally ever designed for. And so, um, the uh, um, you know I, I heard what Ryan was saying and I understand what he's saying about having different versions of Quick, but like but even in the, even in the case Ryan's talking about, um, uh, bear, um, you know that that you could get like a very large as I as I recall this conversation the clients only spoke actually one version of Quick anyway, and so what actually happened was the um, the uh, uh, the clients would just say the servers would say no and the client would come back with TLS as opposed to coming back with like Quick version blah, um, so. Um, but and certainly, and certainly that's a reasonable, viable story in any case. Um, so, um, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm not really persuaded that we need the clients to be um, uh, uh, that um, uh, 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 that flexible in this matter. Um, but that said, again, I'm not really going to lie down on the road over this. Um, uh, but I do think we need to distinguish between these cases where the client ignorance and these cases of we're trying to like shield the client version number from, um, or, or information the client hello from attackers. Because it's not clear to me that they're the same solution. Thanks, Eka. Um, just as a chair interject, there are, are there some of those cases that you describe. Are they like actually documented somewhere? Like, are we are we agreeing on? the kind of classification of problems that people are trying to solve. This isn't just directed at you, Eka, but, but kind of to, to people in general. I'd be happy to write it down. I don't think we do. Uh, personally, I think that that would help. So uh, I would appreciate that. And if, if no one else does, then I'll, I'll give you a lot of appreciation. Um, anyway, uh, on to the next person, which is Christian in, in the queue. Well, I mean, uh, I'm listening and I, I think that we need to make progress. Uh, I'm looking, uh, I've been looking at uh, David's draft and, uh, and, and the various proposal. I mean, I don't think that those drafts are too onerous to implement. I mean, if we, if we want to implement that, we could. And uh, I could probably be done and implement that in Pico Quick in uh, maybe a week from now. So that that by itself, I don't. I agree with David that the, the complexity argument is weak. I'd like to have some practice on the 
idea of changing a version number midstream, which is what is proposed in the compatible version. I am skeptical of that because, I mean, the chances there of uh, tripping on your own shoelaces are quite high. But that's that's the kind of stuff that we'll find with interrupt trials. And I I do believe that uh, on that basically not having incompatible negotiation will be a commitment to only do TLS forever. I, I cannot buy that. So I think we do need to have the incompatible version part. And more precisely, we do need to have the protection of incompatible version negotiation as a core piece of the mechanism. So that's where I stand now. Thank you. Um, skipping over a lot of chat, um, which is good. Keep it coming. We have Ryan. Yeah, I wanted to follow up uh, on on what Ecker said. Um, it is certainly true that during the um, uh, most of the time that Chrome was speaking quick in production, it did not exercise the version negotiation mechanism. That is true. Um, it is not true that the version negotiation uh, mechanism was never used. In fact, um, Google internal health checking tools that, that check the health of QUIC do precisely that. Um, so, so that mechanism very much has been used. Uh, that being said, um, what I, I may be mischaracterizing what I think I'm hearing, um, but what, what I think I'm hearing is uh, a large number of folks that feel there's a need for incompatible version negotiation uh, and a set of folks like Ecker who think we probably don't need it but aren't willing to lie down in the road to to use his words um, to me that sounds an awful lot like rough consensus to move forward on trying to solve incompatible version negotiation I don't think what I just said says anything about it whether we should or shouldn't do compatible version negotiation and so I wonder if it might make sense in the interest of trying to move forward um, instead of trying to figure out what sort of permutation of problems are we gonna solve all at once by one proposal, it feels like we have basically rough consensus on solving incompatible negotiation. And so I wonder if it would make sense to, to see if we can get rough consensus on that. And if so, move forward to, to figuring out what rough consensus might be on compatible version negotiation. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, David, next, please. Um, now, I'm just laughing because uh, people are queuing up to die on hills and lie on tracks. Uh, where's Dimitri when you need him? Um, so just I wanted to add one point, uh, like specifically about incompatible version negotiation. The Edgar raised a really good point that for th a lot of things that are, you know, TLS based, we're going to want uh, most likely, maybe not always, but most likely, most often something compatible because I fully expect Quick V2 to look a whole lot like Quick V1. Not necessarily always, but mostly. Uh, but on the topic of, and and then, you know, there's a whole other class, which is, you know, let's do use the SSH key exchange over Quick. Uh, we should totally build a version of SSH over Quick. That'd be cool. But there's, I don't foresee a use case where a client is going to say, I'm debating between TLS and WebPKI and SSH. Like, that's not a thing. Those are two different, completely different things. Um, and so, in, for those cases, like, they're, you, you wouldn't be having the same, uh, the two on the same connection. Uh, and I think this also applies to noise. Uh, there's, a, there's a cool proposal about how to use the noise key exchange in Quick. And I think, there are use cases where that's great, but you're not going to be loading a web page over that because for a web page, you want the web PKI. However, there is an important point where all this comes together. Um, you can have different key exchanges with the web PKI. And the, and the most notable example is Google Quick Crypto versus TLS. They both use TLS certificates and, that are backed by the web PKI for loading web pages, but the key exchange protocols are incompatible. And so we actually do have this in production today. 
Chrome supports ITF Quick Draft 29 and Google Quick Crypto version 50, both of which are backed by the same certificates, the same PKI, but are have no hope of being compatible unless you go with MT's crazy option using coalesce packets, which is kind of cool yet terrifying. But those cannot be compatible because they're different kinds of key shares. Uh, and that is a case we already had today. I wouldn't exclude that five years down the road, we decide to build a new quick key exchange that's not TLS. Maybe we won't, maybe, maybe Ecker will lie down in the road, um, but we should have that option open to us. So specifically, that's kind of why I really care about uh, incompatible version negotiation. And then on the topic of why I really care about compatible version negotiation, uh, just to quickly summarize points that have already been made, uh, if we force people to burn a round trip, they won't use this and they will do things that are unideal. So I'm hearing a lot of support from folks who want either one or either the other or either both. Um, are, are folks gonna lie down in the tracks to say that the other one must not be in these documents? Thanks, David. Uh, I think that's a very good question. Um, and I ask people to to think about it and respond um, if, if they want to. But um, for the time being, we have Eka in the queue. So please step on up. Yeah, I mean, I think like, I don't agree with everything David just said, but I do think that it's important to have compatible for the same reasons that David indicated, which is that it's going to be like a lousy if we can't make any change whatsoever um, that involves a version number without taking a run trip hit. And so, um, and given that like a, like ninety nine percent of the complexity about like the, about, about like about, about the uh, of the negotiation design is in the determining incompatible works fine, and you can see that by looking at Martin's document where like the first like like it has like one paragraph about how the compatible negotiation design works and a bunch of stuff about how compatible works. Um, I think removing that would be a pretty big mistake, and I do feel quite strong about that. Um, I'm more than happy to have both, as as evidenced by the fact that David and I wrote a document which has both. Thank you. Uh, Jana, please. Thanks, Lucas. Um, I I don't have a strong so I have an opinion, uh, but I'm I don't I'm not going to lie down. I'll be clear. I'm not going to lie down on the tracks or the roads for any of this fucking stuff. This is like way too little to lie down on the road for. Um, but uh, in terms of the compatible version negotiation stuff, I think it's 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 again. I I, I would like somebody to clarify to me when I should use compatible version negotiation and when I should simply use transport parameter extension mechanisms. It's something that will be, you know, maybe it's clearer in, 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 in David and Ecker's heads. And if it is, then I would appreciate that guidance in the draft. Um, and I, I don't, and this is again coming back to the point that I don't see a difference between the two in terms of mechanism. Uh, and maybe I'm missing something subtle here. I don't think I am because I think we're not creating any new mechanisms. We are using existing mechanisms to call something version negotiation there. That's how I read it. Um, the in terms of uh, um, I do want to raise another point, and this Christian has raised this twice already, and I think it's important. The synchronization points where we can switch versions in the compatible case are known. If they are new, I don't see them. If they are known, then they sort of limit where you can change the versions, anyways. And again. The question there becomes what can we accomplish with transport parameters there versus something like this, something like compatible version negotiation. So um, the the uh, on the incompatible one, I just I'll quickly add that there are lots of spaces in which we don't understand ways in which we might need to change versions. It's it's unfair to say we don't need to do noise. That's too limiting. Uh, the whole TCP doesn't have version negotiation, and we suffered with that, right, for a very long time, and and that's not something we want to 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 relive. Um, being able to do switch versions and being able to test them was something that we've said for a long time. We want to do. We don't want quick. We want to ossify. We want something else also out there. And if everything is happening under the cover inside uh, crypto cover, then it's not something that we are really testing things happening on the wire. So incompatible versions are the ones that I actually want to test. Those are the ones that I actually want to deploy um, to make sure that we don't ossify on this version of QuickView. And if that means 
that we change the uh, header format of the quick packet, then maybe that's what it is just for fun. But that's that's a possibility too. That's all I've got. Yeah, we, we've got David, you queued up to, to respond to some of your questions, Jonah. So, um, no, thanks, John. It's totally possible that I, I did a poor job explaining the need for these things in the document. And actually, I don't, I won't say it's possible. I'd say it's guaranteed because uh, that's why we're all here. Because this document is clearly not clear enough to convince everyone that it's amazing. Uh, and also probably it's not amazing. Um, but uh, all things aside, I, I see two reasons why uh, there is value in compatible version negotiation over um, extensions. Because you're absolutely right that for many things, you could write a quick extension that completely rewrites the short header format, not the part of the invariance. I mean, what's inside the encryption? Uh, you could negotiate something and then completely rewrite the protocol after that. That is a fact. Um, but there are kind of two things. Um, one thing, if you have compatible version negotiation, you can start um, modifying, let's say, handshake packets, for example. The client sends an initial, the server does compatible version negotiation to version two, and then the client sends uh, his its handshake packets as version two, and those can have a completely different format to the one from version one. So that is one thing you can do with compatible version negotiation that you can't uh, quite as uh, you could do it with uh, extensions, but then it becomes grosser. So that's not a very compelling argument, but I see this more as an architectural long-term thing, which might be a more compelling argument. If you say, all right, the we, we, we've come up with this idea that re completely rewrites how quick short um, uh, forward secure packets, short headers are. And it's great. And it's the world we want to live in going into the future. Uh, if we do it with extensions, we will be in this world like TLS where forever we are in quick version one with extension called quick version two with extension called quick version four and you pile on things for all eternity. Whereas if you had conceptually think of it as a new version, you would say, okay, this is version two. For a transitional period, clients will say, I will speak one because there are more servers that speak one here than today that speak two. And the compatible upgrade allows them to seamlessly upgrade. And then as time passes, servers update their code you reach a point where more servers speak quick v2 than quick v1, that you can now start defaulting quick v2. And then a little bit longer after that, you can completely deprecate or remove the code for quick v1. So this allows us to have an ecosystem that evolves as opposed to something that is stuck piling on one thing after the an another for all of eternity. And that's why I think I really want us to go in that direction because Sure, you can make it work. That's what we did with TLS. But being able to have the evolvability of this protocol would be really nice. Thanks, David. Uh, Echo was in the queue. Yeah, I mean, I think like the reason I think the reasons David just gave are like what are the reasons I would make as well. That basically, if you don't have like like yes, you can always screw around with extensions and transform parameters and get what you want, but like. When that's the only thing you can do, you get like a giant, like as as John says, a bucket of transport parameters, and that just turns out to be very difficult to manage in like um, as the protocol evolves. And so that's one of the reasons, like why well, like TLS one three has a different version number because it just got like, too too hard to manage like all the different like extension conceptually. So I mean like like yeah, you can always like keep doing it. <laughs> like so like is it like and, and that's exactly what we'll do if like you know if we don't allow this to happen. But that's the reason why I think we should do it. <laughs> um, um, because I think, like we'll be sad. I think we sad if we don't. Um, uh, yeah. Um. Okay, Jana, did you want to respond? I, I do. I, I appreciate that. I think. I think. Uh, so at least it's clear to me what we're talking about here. And that's what I was trying to. I. I didn't mean to say that it's a bad idea. I could, to be clear, I'm trying to understand exactly what we get here, as against a bucket of transport parameters. I'll respond to one point that David just made. I think I I I, I think that uh, uh, being able to do internal, like he said, like without changing the first packets to be version one, changing uh, um, changing you know trying to trying to opportunistically switch up to version two when we can is a nice thing. 
And I would argue that in that world, you can certainly do that with the bucket of transport parameters. And then when you're ready, you try to do the proper version negotiation by saying my first packet is going to be V2, I'm sorry. Right? So, uh, so long as we are starting off with, as so long as we are bootstrapping with V1, we are living in a world where we are ossified with V1. That's kind of how I see it in this particular, in this particular matrix that we're building here. If we have to start with V1 and then switch to V2 internally, well, we've also already ossified V1. Right. So it, it, at that point, it doesn't, we can do a large number of things internally within V1 because we protected that with crypto and so we are safe there. But, um, okay, at, at, at least understand this. I don't have a strong uh, uh, opposition to compatible. I just think that uh, it'd be good for, at this point, it really becomes a question of, should we do uh, X with transport parameters or should we do it as a version negotiation bucket, right? And that's a question of, taste to some extent, and maybe we'll deal with it when we get there. I don't have strong opposition to trying to describe that, uh, but I think we'll have to, we'll keep running up against this every time you're trying to define a compatible version. Like somebody says, hey, should this be compatible version two? And I'll be like, well, no, it's only got two transport parameters and you don't need it. Uh, I will challenge the one thing that David, you said, which is, I don't, I, I don't know this. And so I'm challenging it because mostly I don't know. And it's easy for me to ask like that and have you explain it. I don't know how you would do this in the middle of a handshake. That's weird to me because I, I, I guess the synchronization, I don't know what the synchronization Sorry. point would be where you would agree on this. Oh, well, you, the, uh, the long header type, uh, assuming, you know, or whatever you like, if we're talking quick V1, this is, it's not an invariant, but, um, you, you would say that initials use the first version and the next one use the other, for example. Or uh, I mean, you would you would use uh, so the, your main synchronization point is the switch from long headers to short headers. So during the handshake, yes. you negotiate a version, and then clearly anything that's a short header is the new version. For everything that is during the handshake that has long headers, you got the version in the packet. That's what you use. Okay, so so I guess okay okay fair enough. So I, I think in that case you get a little bit more for doing. So the question here then becomes, is that that value necessary? Like, do we have actually, is that is there significant value in defining this whole, like you said, I think I'll, I'll repeat what you said, which is that this is not the most strong, this is not the strongest motivation here is to be able to change the, the handshake packets. So I agree with that, but yeah, okay. That's, that's helpful. Thank you. Hey, so just looking. At the queue, David, are you are you dead? No, have you got? Uh, actually, no. I wanted to respond to another point of John's really quickly about the ossification of Quick View One. Um, I don't think we're there yet, and I think we can still avoid it. So let me give you an example with the big bad internet being ossified. Uh, yeah, like take TLS. Uh, recently, browsers dropped support for TLS 1.0 and 1.1. We managed to move the ecosystem forward in the presence of ossification. And I want us to do something similar with Quick, where we evolve Quick from V1 to V2 to V3. And you know, and ideally we keep this joint well oiled and uh, you know, following Langley's law and uh, make sure that we have a new one. And then once the new one gets deployed enough, we aggressively drop support from the old ones. Um, we'll have to see, you know, there are many because there, there are consequences, but if we were able to drop support for TLS 1.0 and 1.1, we will be able to drop support for Quick V1 in favor of Quick V2 someday. The, the big debate in the, or the big question to answer in the extension versus compatible version negotiation is once we've reached that day and drop support for Quick V1, will we have Quick V2 that can stand in its own right? Or will we have a Quick V2 that looks like Quick V1 with add-ons? And, I think that it would be nice to spend a little bit of work now to like formalize these things so that we can have a cleaner protocol, you know, for our grandchildren or because I'm planning to retire eventually. Thanks. Um, yeah, as, as Eka notes, we, we have 20 minutes left. Um, I'd like to hear from Ryan, who's been in the queue for a while. And then uh, my co-chair, Matt, wanted to say a few words. Um, which I think is going to give a, you know, kind of a roundup of, of the, 
the chair's perspective here. I see some people popping up after that, um, and I think we'll have time for them. Um, just as a comment from myself, I'd love to run a poll just so I could get a view of how the people on this call feel about uh, compatible and incompatible, because sometimes people are breaking up and I'm maybe not getting the right view. I'm not allowed to run a poll from the with the web app, so that's annoying. Um, but it's not a vote anyway. So um, I I would like to find a way to to gain a sense of the feeling whether that's taken to the mailing list. I don't know. It's annoying we're not on Meet Echo and we can take a virtual hum. Um, but Lucas, yeah, that, that's may what I suggest think. we have twenty six people in this. We all fit on a screen. We can simply raise our hands uh, or, or do can't. something here. That that there's a reaction. There's a reaction thing here that that you can use at the bottom okay. of the WebEx thing. We can say thumbs up to something. I'm just, I'm just okay. here. Uh, oh, oh yeah, it works, doesn't it? I'm seeing all kinds of stuff here. Um, let, let me have a <laughs> think while Matt, Matt says, says Okay, yeah, so my, my thing was that, so my, my reading of uh, the discussion so far is that several people are passionate about there being incompatible version negotiation and that being required. Uh, a few people have made the argument that maybe it is not required, but doesn't seem to be, you know, no one's like, it must not be there, right? Um, compatible version negotiation seems like we think that it, you know, it probably has a reason to exist, but it's not clear this, not clear when you would use it exactly. Um, I will also note though, we have a draft that has both of these things in it. And I, don't, I have not heard anyone say that they have particular issues with the draft as it currently is. So it sounds to me like we have people that think both of these kinds of version negotiation should probably exist. And we don't really have anyone that really thinks that one should definitely not exist. And we have people willing to design or continue to design the system which supports both. Um, so I the question I'd like to pose is, is anyone really opposed to going forward and with the current drafts that David and Ecker have, or, you know, it, they can change obviously, but like, is there anything fundamentally that we think is not there and that we really don't want to have both of these things in a version negotiation extension? And yes, Martin, this this is why not both. Basically, is there any is there a compelling reason besides purity and oh well in practice we probably won't need both. Is there any reason? Is there any disadvantage someone can come up with for having both, other than it's mildly more annoying to implement? And maybe I don't know how when to use compatible version negotiation versus just piling on extensions. So uh, I guess is is anyone actually Martin Duke? Do you want to say something? Because you're in the queue, I guess. Yeah, I mean it, it's not an answer to your question. Um, I, I just wanted to make a comment in support of, of, of compatible negotiation and why we should do it now. Is this the right time for that? Yeah, go ahead. Because no one else is okay. So um, I, I take um. I take a backseat to no one in sweating the ostentation of the of the long header version field. Um, I think my track record on that is pretty long. Um, if the worst should happen and we do ossify on those four bytes being one uh, at some point, then um, we are going to need to do a TLS thing and have a back channel transport parameter thing, which is compatible negotiation. And so I think um, it would be unfortunate if we just did incompatible. And, uh, and then like found that ossified and then had to back in like the compatible thing and try to like have all these hosts where some of them are doing one type of version negotiation and one of them are doing another. That sounds like a really a, a way to, to shoot ourselves in the foot. Thanks. I see uh, s some, you know, people saying that both or all three is good. Um, it sounds like Miria, she doesn't know when we should use compatible versions. And I think that's a that's a legitimate question. That's a lot of what Jana is saying too, which is that 
it's not really entirely clear what's the semantic difference between a compatible version and just using transport parameters and extensions. And I think that's a legitimate question, but it's almost uh, sort of, which is to me anyway, it seems sort of aside from the mechanism. And so we, we kind of want to make forward progress on the mechanism right now. And it sounds, it doesn't sound to me unless anyone can, yeah, we, and we probably should have guidance in the draft about, you know, when to use compatible versions, because as Ecker said, the mechanism for compatible version negotiation is really simple. Um, so, but I think we are probably approaching a place where there's, it sounds like there's kind of roughish consensus that this draft can go forward and we can add more stuff to it, mostly in the meta points. Does anyone want to add comments to that? Is that like I got Kazuho in the queue? So I'll say Kazuho. Thank you. So I think I might have said this earlier, but I'm not really sure if the current design of compatible version upgrade uh, really meets the requirement easily enough to reduce one round trip. And that's because it only carries the version number. I mean, typically, a transport uh, has properties being associated to the version, so we need to transport those alongside the version. But it doesn't really provide that opportunity. I mean, so there are things like that. We, when we try to design compatible version upgrade in sense that, you know, in a way that it reduces the round trip. Let's say that TLS, we, we try to use a compatible version that uses something other than TLS. Then, you know, we have to, transmit the first flight of the alternate handshake transcript in the parameters. But, you know, the current mechanism doesn't define that kind of way. I mean, so my point is that I'm not entirely sure if we'd be very happy with the current design when we design V2 for compatible version operate. That's one of the reasons I think we should better plan the design of compatible version upgrade to when it becomes necessary. Thank you. Okay, I think uh, Miria wanted to say something. To, to elaborate on my point a little bit. So what makes me nervous here is that we don't have a good understanding of our safe self water compatible version is, right? And like, uh, if we don't understand that, then we get easily in the situation where people just randomly design a new version instead of using transfer parameters or whatever. So as long as we don't know what the use case is and how a compatible version would look like, designing a mechanism for that doesn't seem to be make sense to me. And I think there is a real risk in in um, providing this and then having uses of the protocol that we don't want to have. And I think the only solution to this is to get a better understanding what compatible solutions should be and how we want to use them before we design a mechanism for it. David, I'm back. I, see. Like, I would say David has got probably a response to that, I would guess. Indeed. Um, I just want to push back on the idea that if uh, someone doesn't fully understand this, we should therefore not do it. Uh, I think that this isn't as misunderstood. I think the concept is fairly simple. Uh, compatible means that you can take a first flight and convert it. Uh, I don't consider that to be outside the realm of imagination. I do agree that we should provide more guidance text to the document in order to make sure that new or uh, designers of new versions don't accidentally shoot themselves in the foot. But I do not see this as a foot gun uh, compared to all the things you can do wrong when designing a new protocol. So I'm really not worried here. I don't think there is like much of a risk. This problem seems to be decently well understood. And we even have some examples of you know the compatible negotiation between draft versions if we wanted to. Um, I'm not particularly concerned here. So, okay, so it, it, it sounds to me like, oh, what Lucas is in, in the queue, but uh, it sounds to me like uh, Ecker, both Ecker and David recognize the compatible versions being vague 
as a problem and are willing to add text to that effect. Um, so it sounds like that's probably the biggest thing that we should take away from this. And also, um, because I think incompatible, it sounds like people agree should probably exist. Um, but that would be a good thing forward for uh, David and Ecker, I think, is working on PRs to, and then people that have concerns about it, like Miria and Jana, reviewing those PRs would be very useful. Um, Lucas? Oh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so I clicked a button and it booted me out of the web app and into into the desktop app. Well, I can actually see everyone now, so I understand what John was talking about earlier. <laughs> um, I, I, unfortunately, I did miss some of the discussion in that process because Matt was coming out of a PlayStation Five controller. Very odd. Um, we're very, we're pretty short of time. But I don't want to I don't want to chew up too much stuff. Um, I think Matt's probably covered a lot of good stuff there. Um, he's got a good handle on this. Um, uh, to me, the, the thing that does stand out is like these design questions um, versus like actually just good improvements to the document, just like you mentioned about guidelines or recommendations or deciding maybe maybe some other document could could help people and that we're not we're not able as a working group to make progress on any of that because we're stuck on on these questions that we've got. Um, we've, we've, we've all expressed a lot of views so far. Um, I did like the suggestion of taking a show of hands for the different options purely as like an illustrative um, view of this that we can then capture somewhere and, you know, continue that discussion elsewhere, put it into the minutes, etc. So I, I would like to trial that while we've got eight minutes um, to do so. Um, so uh, the, the instruction here would be to um, use the raise hand button uh when you support one of the options i will present um and yes john is suggesting doing a trial question so um i'll do the the classic do you like chocolate ice cream and i see a bunch of hands um there's some thumbs up the thumbs up aren't so great because they disappear so any emoji reactions harder what I'd, i would do like as the suggestion says is to take screenshots then i can go away and count those things um and just get a, a rough view so yes and you it's can clear your it's also the participants window which may be an easier way oh. to do this oh that's thank you man um cool yeah and actually it sorts them so that's a lot easier okay that's that's great um yeah um david suggested maybe a preference in the chat i i honestly don't know and we're, we're short of time <laughs> uh let, let's go with the show hands um to start with so yes uh the first question it will be uh do people believe that uh compatible version negotiation is a requirement please show your hands Give you another 10 seconds or so to get there. Hey, bear with me. Okay, thank you for that. Um, and now I'll ask a different question. So if you want to lower your hands, just just to avoid any doubt here. The question is, do you believe incompatible version negotiation is a requirement? Raise your hand if you believe it is yes. People have figured out how to click the button. Or are asleep. Let's give it a few seconds to find the things. I'm gonna I'm gonna take a screenshot in five seconds. Great, thank you for that. Um, let me just 
by those screenshots so I can count for the record. Uh, by my counting, the number of hands for compatible yes was nine. Please make that 10. I thought we were having for the wrong, I thought we were having the opposite order. Sorry, Echo. Okay. Ten. Um, and, and the number of hands for incompatible yes was eighteen. Do you want to ask the opposite questions just for complete completeness? I think it's going to be zero. Uh, yeah, let's do it. We've got a few minutes. Okay, this is so fun. Um, we'll do it in the same order. Please raise your hand if you uh, for compatible no. I'll give it a couple more seconds. Okay, let's call it there. I see I see one hand. Um and then the opposite questions. So uh, should we is... ask uh like so Chris Wood had his hand. Could should we ask him if this was intentional and something we should oh. report or whether he forgot to take his hand down? I was you taking forgot, notes, Chris. sorry. It was a mistake. Okay, <laughs> zero hands up for compatible no. Thank you for that clarifying question, David. And then the final See, question. Matt, not, yeah. not everybody's figured out how to do the button <laughs> question thing yet. So I say, I this is not a final vote. But... <laughs> anyway, um, yes, uh, please raise your hand if you believe that incompatible version negotiation is not a requirement. And I don't see any hands there. Okay, thank you. Thank you for just finding patience with that one. Um, yes, we have three minutes. Matt, is there anything you'd like to, to pick up here? I would just reiterate what it, it sounds like maybe Ecker and David can confirm, but it sounds like they'd be willing to incorporate some of this feedback. It doesn't sound like anyone else is willing to come up with any other drafts. Is that right? If not, if, if you are really, really willing to come up with a totally alternate design, please get in the queue now, but it sounds like we have, you know, willing participants in the current draft. And so, and we have feedback on that, at least meta feedback. So maybe we should just move forward with that. We're which, happy. And, and we're just to say incorporating both. We're happy to make the changes that were indicated in the, in the in discussion. Um, and I understand Martin has some suggestions about spelling this differently and we're interested in hearing his suggestions in more detail. Right, and Martin says to confirm on the list, that's also a, a very good idea. And, and to Possible. reiterate uh, what Ecker said, yes, we're absolutely happy to take this feedback. Uh, please make sure to take your, like send your feedback to the list or to GitHub issues if you haven't already, so we don't miss it. Yeah, and, and just for that final minute, I'd like to thank everyone for um, attending today and putting some effort in and having some good conversation. Um, it's it wasn't an easy subject for this one and I, I feel that we've made some progress we can confirm that on the list and i you know i do look forward to contributions and progress being made on the drafts and you know maybe when we get around to the next itf meeting uh, we we can get back into the the issue tracker and and some actual more tangible discussion can uh, can happen so thank you